attachment theory. It's more than just making sure our physical needs are taken care of. The emphasis here is on emotional connection. Every human being, without exception, that means men and women alike, every human being needs someone who is available and responsive to their needs. We're born with an attachment system already in place. Now, this is not something that you can find in any kind of anatomy and physiology graph or chart or book or anything like that, because it's an emotional system. It's a survival system. It's not an actual physical body system, although it does certainly activate many of our bodily systems when we're in distress, right? So what we need as infants is not really a lot different than what we need as adults. But we need to have had a really good experience with a parent or a caregiver as children in order for us to be able to grow into a healthy adult. Now that kind of goes without saying, I'm sure that you understand what I mean by that. However, what I don't want you to think is that someone has to be always and forever available and responsive to you. In fact, you want to have someone who's just good enough. However, there are a lot of people whose families have gone through some sort of a, a trauma or a personal crisis, a family crisis, or maybe a parent who was alcoholic or a, a parent who worked too much and there wasn't sufficient availability and responsiveness to the child. So you can see that this security of attachment is actually going to be um, on a continuum from healthy attachment to an insecure attachment. And that's what we're going to talk about. So when we say someone has been consistently available and responsive to your emotional needs, that means that your anger and your fear and your sadness and your hurt will naturally begin to dissipate when you make contact with someone who cares about you. Now, again, they don't have to do it 100% of the time. Nobody can pull that off, right? But we have to have been soothed by somebody else enough times that we can actually draw on those memories and the feelings associated with them in order to be able to develop what psychologists call a secure emotional attachment. Based on these emotional memories that you have from childhood, you have developed a template for your relationships, including romantic relationships, that includes basic beliefs that are essential for secure emotional attachment. Now, hopefully those basic beliefs are positive ones. They are, I am lovable and I can depend on others to be loving towards me and to help meet my needs. And when we don't have adequate emotional connection, our attachment system will instantly begin to malfunction. That's where we get into defensiveness and denial of a, there even being a problem is very self-protective. Um, I don't need to be afraid because nothing's happening. Denial, anger, anxiety, avoidance. We try to gain a sense of control over ourselves and over the other people. Attachment is about your emotional connection. You need someone who's available and someone who's responsive. Your current attachment system can be identified by evaluating the opposite characteristics of available and responsive. That is avoidance, which is a tendency to not be available. And anxiety is a tendency to react rather than respond. Okay, so let's look at a chart here. So we've got avoidance on the bottom means they're unavailable. And we've got low range to high range. Then we've got anxiety, which is the non-responsive. And that may seem like it. I'm talking about responsive versus reactive. And again, we have low to high. So someone who is low on avoidance and low on anxiety is going to develop a secure attachment style. That is, that person will still experience some anxiety because that's part of life, but it's going to be at much lower levels than someone who is insecurely attached. When a securely attached person is worried 
or concerned about something either inside or outside of the relationship, they're going to seek out their partners to help them talk things through. After their talk, they feel less worried. If that sounds like you, you're emotionally secure. If you are low on anxiety and high on avoidance, you would develop a detached style. Now, detached is also known as dismissing. Um, that's how I refer to it in my first book, was as the dismissing style. A detached person sees little, if any, value in emotional intimacy, and so they become counterdependent in relationships. They will often choose independence and autonomy over relational interdependence. In other words, the damage has been done and they simply aren't interested in close relationships. They have been able to disconnect themselves sufficiently from their emotions and they won't even bother with it. In fact, a detached person is not going to seek out counseling, is not going to be looking up stuff about relationships on the internet, is not going to be willing to talk to a partner not because they're afraid, but just because they're so incredibly detached from everything. Very, very emotionally disconnected. And it's fine with that. The next type that we're going to talk about is someone who is high in anxiety and um, low in avoidance. So they're going to feel anxious, but they're going to tend to seek out someone to help them with that anxiety. Now, when they're overly focused, I in the book, again, I refer to this as the preoccupied style. One who is focused worries about relationship. Almost constantly, actually. They have difficulty loving, trusting, and respecting a mate. Their anxiety, when they're in that uh, mode of seeking someone, remember they're low on avoidance, they're high on anxiety. And so what they're doing is they're coming across to their mate as angry critical, demanding, and controlling, even dominating. Not the best method for developing a relationship. Okay, now our next style, our last style is number four, is the fearful person. And what I refer to in the book is the fearful avoidant. This person is high on anxiety, but they're also high in avoidance. So that means they're going to be kind of freaking out about stuff but they don't want anybody to know. And they don't want anybody to know for a couple of different reasons, but mainly because they're afraid of their own vulnerability. They expect that they will be hurt. They believe they don't deserve to be treated well. And although they deeply desire a relationship with someone, they're not likely to take the risk because they're so terrified of looking bad, feeling rejected, or being criticized. So, who do you think will be most likely to get stuck in a negative cycle in a relationship? So negative cycle is one that spirals in, in terms of intensity of disagreements, it spirals upward. Uh, in terms of connectedness, it spirals downward. So negative cycle is just a spiral that just continues to build. Things don't get resolved. They just go round and round and round like a merry-go-round. So who do you think would be? 